Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final day of the Beyond School Hours Conference. We are so happy that you're here. Um, please let us know where you're attending from. You can put your name and your location in the chat. I, I do want to give some special recognition to our Texas family, our attendees and presenters, exhibitors, our NAC members. Um, you all are the embodiment of resilience, and we just want you to know that we're thinking about you. Stay safe and stay warm. We do have a couple of housekeeping and announcements this morning before we get started. Um, after the keynote, we have two short presentations. Uh, Gwen Hughes, C Senior Program Officer from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, is going to give us an update on some current Mott initiatives. And then Dr. Terry Peterson will briefly describe a new federal funding opportunity for summer and after school programs. So please stick around uh, after the keynote. Uh, also, don't forget to visit all of our exhibitors. To, you need to get your code words so that you can win some amazing prizes and you need to submit those by 3 p.m. Eastern today. Um, another thing we'd really love for you to do is to fill out your session evaluations. Evaluation is so important to us. This is our first virtual conference. We want to know what we're doing well and what we might want to improve for the future. And the overall conference evaluation as well is really important. Please don't miss our grand finale today at 4 p.m. Eastern. I am just dying to know what we're doing with this little goodie bag that we got in our swag boxes. So Erica Petrelli is amazing and uh, I can't wait to see what she's got in store for us. So now uh, it is my pleasure to introduce um, uh, our introduction for the keynote. So Ralph Smith, the managing director of the campaign for grade level reading has graciously uh, agreed to introduce our keynote for today. So Ralph, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Elizabeth, and thank you. You know, back in the old days, and that was a whole year ago, my daily commute was not limited to navigating between Zoom Microsoft Teams, WebEx, Ring Central, and the occasional Blue Jeans. Back in those olden days, I actually rode Amtrak. And one evening a couple of years ago, while on Amtrak, I had the opportunity to sit with Jeff, the spouse of today's keynote speaker. After a bit of back and forth, I told him how much I and so many others admired Kathy, how much we had learned from her and why we all agreed that she was this brilliant, high energy, generous and gracious force of nature. But that is where there's some major ongoing and seemingly unresolvable disagreement. Some of us insist that as a force of nature, she is that proverbial immovable object. Others are equally certain that she is the quintessential irresistible force. Turning to Jeff, I asked him to be the tiebreaker. Now, if this were just five years ago, when facts still mattered, this is a point at which I would confess that I made up the part of the story that suggests I actually mustered the courage to ask Jeff that question about his spouse. The truth is, I did not. But in this post-truth era, I can probably attribute to Jeff my answer. And my answer is that when it comes to championing more hopeful futures for children, today's keynote speaker is the immovable object and the irresistible force. And more than a mere force of nature, Kathy Hurst Pastor has been forged by nature into that rare gem that her family shares with Temple University, countless professional organizations, 
and through her brainchild, playful learning landscapes with communities across the nation, around the world, and with us here this morning. I am so delighted that Rhonda Lauer, Elizabeth, and the Beyond School Hours team, they've afforded me the opportunity to say good morning. Thank you and welcome to Kathy Hurst-Bashik, our keynote speaker this morning. Kathy. Oh, Ralph, thank you so much. That was just such a wonderful introduction. And, um, but as I told Ralph, one of the things I really think of most is that I have three kids who taught me everything I know. And my kids taught me that if we can just see the world like children, we really can change things in a much better way. So today I wanna to share with you a talk that I pulled together called Learning is Everywhere. And I'm hoping that you can all see my screen now. Is this working? <clears throat> I use Learning is Everywhere as a way to rethink how we educate our children through play. And what you're gonna see is that I'm gonna use this theory inside and outside of classrooms. But let me tell you why. I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I wanna start with a very simple example. What do you hear? And most of you will say, well, of course, what I hear is clapping. But you see, you can see that through a different lens. And the minute you do, all of a sudden you see, wait a minute, when people clap together in a drum circle in my class, they have to listen to each other. They have to collaborate. And wait a minute, they're actually dividing time because that's rhythm. And that means you're doing math and division, all that in a clapping game. Well, let's try another one. Here's a beautiful piece of artwork and take it home to mom. She puts it on the refrigerator or dad, of course. And the question is, what could you possibly make out of Marley's 24 month old Marley's artwork or Dahani's 34 month old artwork? Because it kind of looks just like smush. But, whoops, if we change the lens, we start to see that Marley couldn't have done that if she couldn't hold her hand on that pencil and keep it down long enough to draw that circle let alone two circles. And look at that beautiful spatial sense and pattern alignment. I mean, this kid has to go into designing at some point. And she must have had intent because she kept doing what she did more than once. Huh, we've changed the lens yet again. And gosh knows, it's been a tough year. Maybe one of the advantages of this year is that most of us have a gazillion Amazon boxes. And the question is, can we change the lens even on an Amazon box? Can it be a house? Can it be a kind of transportation? What are we doing when we change the lens? We're seeing the learning in every small grain of our society, in the trees, in the nature, in our homes, which become museums. And I think you're gonna find that this way of looking at the world can be pretty darn exciting. So my argument today is, it's time to change the lens on the way we think about learning in and out of school, on the way that parents and policymakers think about the social and academic value of an integrated education that is fostered through playful, active learning. <clears throat> Let me give you some interesting facts. We've entered a new era. It's called the knowledge age, in which information is said to be doubling every two and a half years. Now, I want you to just think about that. That means that even if I taught kids everything that we know today, in two and a half years, they'd know only 50%. This is a problem. We need to help kids learn how to learn. It's not enough to just get factoids. Integrating and innovation are going to be key. And author Daniel Pink put it so well. He said, in the past few decades, 
They belong to a certain kind of person with a certain kind of mind, computer programmers who could crank code, lawyers who could craft contracts, and MBAs who could crunch numbers. I love this line. Even at home, risk it, say it out loud with me. But the keys to the kingdom are changing hands. One more time. But the keys to the kingdom are changing hands. I love that line. The future belongs to a different kind of person. The creators and empathizers, the pattern recognizers, the meaning makers, the artists, the inventors, and the designers. With this as a base, we can begin to ask whether we're preparing children for that workplace of tomorrow. And I'd like to argue we're not. Our current model of education and parenting is founded on the idea that if our kids master content, they will be successful. Road to Harvard. But what counts has undergone a revolution in Google and Wiki. <clears throat> so we can talk about the traditional way, preparing children for reading, for writing, and for math. And what I'll call the 21st century way, supporting children to include content, but go beyond it, to ask for happy, healthy, thinking there it is, caring and social children who become collaborative, creative, competent, and responsible citizens of tomorrow. <clears throat> now, the crazy person that I am, I go to my local Trader Joe's and I literally have stopped parents with their children and asked, what are you looking for in your kids? Are you looking for children to be great in reading, writing, and math and memorize what they do at school? Or would you rather have kids who are happy, healthy? They're thinking they still know their maths, but they're caring and social beings who will be collaborative, good citizens. I never once have gotten anybody who said to me, I hope they're great test takers when they grow up. Indeed, the famous Finnish scientist and author, Posse Salberg, who just wrote a beautiful book called Let the Children Play, reminds us that our laser focus on too narrow a view of success, it hasn't produced results. Note the United States 2013 PISA scores, which were not so different from the 2019 scores, from students who spent an entire career under NCLB No Child Left Behind. And we look even worse now. Look hard at this map and see if you can find the United States. Oh, yeah, there's Finland up here. Hmm. Oh, and there's Canada. Uh, yeah, the US is down here, but it's in the middle. <clears throat> it's in the middle of the clump. Our kids simply aren't thriving. And my machine has decided to stop working. Uh, let's see if we can make this happen again. Hmm. All right. For some reason, I have just lost control, folks. Kathy, your slides weren't advancing, so Paula has taken over. Um, she'll advance them for you. Okay, then I don't know where I am actually anymore. Sorry about that, but I need to get back onto you. Love living in a technologically advanced world. All right, let's see if I can get you back. Hmm. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Um, I can't see anything right now, which is a bit of a problem. So, Paula, can you give her back the, the controls, please? So something just disappeared. What I can do is restart my computer. I promise to go a little faster. No. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Kathy, if you don't mind, you can if you can see them on your screen, I can advance them for we're on the slide that you were talking about with the um, sadly I can't see anything right now and I can't even move my screen. So I'm not real sure what to do. 
Let me see if I can. Well, if you need to um, restart your computer real fast, maybe we can have uh, Gwen and Terry hop on real fast. Instead of going at the end, they can talk about their funding opportunity and Mott initiatives real quick. While that we sounds wait. good. I'll be back, everybody. Okay. Sure. Sorry for the for the interruption, everyone. Uh, oh, well. uh, Kathy will be right back. Terry, are you ready to hop in? Sure. I don't know if you could. Uh, Let's me get not. Terry's slides up here. Okay. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, uh, this will be a, a very short presentation, but very important about available funding that is likely to affect you, all the folks on this at this conference. There will soon be available meaningful funding in your school districts that can be used, let me stress, can, for a major expansion of quality summer and after school programs. To recover from all the COVID learning disruptions and connections, there has been never a time when we needed more engaging, enriching summer and after school opportunities. You are probably eager to help, but where can you find the needed funding to expand and improve these critically needed opportunities in your communities? Let me explain about this brand new, very significant funding it is literally on the way to your school districts now, but how might you approach securing some of these monies for more and better summer and after school opportunities? This nationwide uh, funding source has a nice long name, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. We call it ESSER II. Think of the number, 54.3 billion, that's with a B is being distributed as we're speaking across the country to school districts and schools. It has been approved for a variety of purposes to help schools and students reconnect and recover from COVID-19. Get an idea of the scope for your schools and your community. The average school district and low wealth schools will receive significant funds. These funds are roughly equal to all the federal monies normally received in a whole school year. An additional roughly 1,000 to 1,500 per student and, and in real high poverty districts, probably as much as $2,000 a student. This can be spent over 30 months. So you can really think of an exciting plan of summer after school, summer after school, learning over the next 30 months. Now here's the catch. After school and summer learning are very much allowable expenses, but not required. So going on to the next slide, how might you, how might you secure some of these funds? If you are a summer or after school or in an after school or summer partnership with a school or district, Consider requesting that 15 to 20% of the new ESSERS monies be allocated for summers and after school. I don't know, can you advance the slides to the next slide? I'll just keep chatting. Uh, so think about it. 15 or 20% of the new ESSERS money, that's not a requirement. You could encourage that if you're in a partnership with a school or school district right now. And here are some very positive ways in which you could uh, use these funding. You could expand the sites for summer and after school learning in school community partnerships in or near schools or neighborhoods with high needs. You could use the funding to provide additional monies for increasing the number of students served, especially in existing high quality sites. You can restart programs that might have closed due to COVID-19. You can improve the strategies for reconnecting and engaging students who need the programs the most. Also think about those of you who are 21st century grantees. You could seek some of these funds with your district and schools 
to expand the type of support you offer in existing sites and even provide more summer and after school sites uh, using your organizational structure. Next slide. Now, when you're working on this, you're gonna to have to keep this in mind for this Esther, Esther monies for after school and summer learning is allowed, not required. So supporters and providers of summer and after school learning and enrichment like you should really join together locally, think together locally about how you could approach your local school officials and then make the case to your superintendents, school boards and principals that, that it would be a great investment of these funds to expand and improve summer and after school programs this summer, after school, this coming school year, next summer and after school the next year, a rare chance to plan ahead. Now you might say, well, won't they do it anyway? They might, but my experience, if you could see me, I have lots of gray hair. So I would suggest you use my mother's advice. If you don't ask, no one else will. Our students and families are depending on you. Thanks so much for all you do. Thank you, Terry. We really appreciate you jumping in. All right, we are gonna give it a go again, Kathy. All right, let's see how this works. <laughs> Can you all see me now? <clears throat> Sorry for that little commercial break, everybody, but we are gonna move on from the boxes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. I'm going to keep it on this screen because when I went full screen, it crashed last time. And we'll see if this way of advancing it works. All right. So moving right along, the argument I want to make for you is that it's time to change the lens on the way we think of learning and education in and out of school. And this is going to be true for parents, for policymakers, and for teachers. I was talking to you about some interesting facts. We're learning factoids wasn't enough, but integrating information is where we need to go in the future. And about Daniel Pink, who suggested that this is our moment. I'd also like to suggest, because it was just brought up in the, in the last um, piece, that maybe after COVID, it really is our moment. Our moment to reassess what we've been doing and what we can do if we see learning everywhere. So in our book, Becoming Brilliant, and in a new piece that we wrote for uh, the Brookings Institution in a big ideas piece, we talked about a new path to education reform in and out of school. And it suggests a way to help everybody change that lens. And this may sound a little shocking to you, but it's going to be through playful learning. And I took a considerable amount of space on this slide just to show you that what I'm about to tell you is actually backed up by thousands and thousands of research papers. But play right now is under siege. The Alliance for Childhood about a decade ago surveyed 142 New York classrooms, 112 LA classrooms, and this is what they found. 25% of the teachers had no time for play in their classrooms. Is this sounding familiar? 61% of New York teachers didn't even have choice time, and this is for kindergartners. 79% of New York teachers for kindergartners were doing test preparation every day. So in 2016, a woman named Daphne Basak wrote a report that kindergarten has now become the new first grade. She suggested that 80% of teachers say that kindergarten should be, kindergartners should be reading, which was up 50% from 1998. Time for the arts? Well, there really isn't time for arts anymore. And time for testing? Well, there's that 29% again. These issues have prompted the American Academy of Pediatricians to write multiple papers, suggesting that as a society, we may need to really move toward finding education everywhere and finding it in play, finding more joy. Indeed, in 2019, 
with Michael Yagman. I was one of the authors of a paper that was called The Power of Play, a pediatric role in enhancing young children. What did we call for? A prescription for play. That play helps grow cognitive and social advantages. And that maybe all of us should have a prescription for play. At the same time, here's some of the toys that were coming out in the market. I had to show you some of this. Our narrow view of success is taking us in the wrong direction. Have any of you seen this new way of doing potty training? It's so exciting. You can actually sit a young child on the potty and you can have an iPad right in front of her so that she can be learning all the while. Of course, my real favorite was this. For pregnant women, using it much like a tampon, you can read books and it will be broadcast inside the womb. I mean, seriously, are we kidding? Where are we as a learning society? So today I'm gonna to talk to you about play in three parts because while I'm gonna talk about play, I'm not just talking about your grandmother's play. I wanna define play, I wanna to talk to you about the advantages of play, and then I wanna to talk to you about how you can foster more play at school, at home, and in the community. So let's start by defining play. Free play is what we mostly think about when we think about play. <clears throat> Whether with objects, fantasy, or make-believe, it's pleasurable and enjoyable, doesn't have any goals, it's spontaneous, it involves active engagement, it's generally consuming, often has a private reality, non-literal, and can contain an element of make-believe. But I wanna change that up a little bit and ask you to think about another type of play that I call guided play. Guided play is when you're in a planned environment, like a really good school classroom that has enriched that classroom with fun activities, toys that provide experiential learning opportunities infused with curricular content. It can also be when adults enhance children's exploration through co-playing with children, asking open-ended questions, not a question like, what color is a banana? but what other things are the same color as a banana? So it's not just a one word answer and suggesting ways to explore materials that children might not even think of. What could you do with a walk? I saw this in a school when I was in San Francisco and it was so impressive, it was a K to 12. The teacher started the day by bringing in a walk, puts the walk, in the center of a circle of children and said, this is not a walk. And each child got up, came into the center and said, no, that's a hat. No, it's a sled and suggested different ways of thinking about the materials. Now it turns out that when we expand our view of play, we learn about what I'm calling playful learning. Play can be initiated by a child and directed by a child, in which case it's free play. That's the building the fort in your living room. It can be initiated by an adult and it can be directed by the child. That's what I'm calling guided play. Going to a children's museum where they have well thought out exhibits, walking into your classroom where you have thought out what you want the children to achieve. But the difference is the children help go through the different things that you've planned to help learn about, whether it's math or whether it's language or whether it's the arts. Think Montessori here, think Reggio Emilia, think progressive education. You can also have something that's initiated by a child. You've seen this a lot, I'm sure. The kid is doing something and in comes bounding the adult and takes over. Oh, are you drawing a circus? No, that wasn't meant to be a circus. It was a family portrait. I call that co-opted play. And then of course, what we often do too much of because we're given such strict regulations is adult initiated, adult directed. That's not really play at all. If it is fun, which we try to make it, 
it's really kind of chocolate covered broccoli, as Hapgood once called it. This is another way of looking at the very same ideas. We suggested that play really might exist on a spectrum from free play up to direct instruction. And here's the spectrum. And what we're looking for is more kind of play in here so that we can have an enjoyable pedagogical approach, but at the same time meeting all the requirements you need to meet in your classroom. So let's just look at the evidence for a moment and then I'll show you how we're using it. There are a lot of advantages to, to play. One is play and coping. I'm working right now with a hospital in Copenhagen, they're redesigning the children's hospital. And they have done an outstanding job of doing a review literature on how you could put more play into hospitals. Why? Because it turns out that even in outpatient settings, you reduce anxiety and distress, even for children with serious illnesses, if you have more play. Kids are more ready, they're more open, they're more trusting. It reduces stress, it has protective factors for well-being, and it reduces any anger that the kids might feel. Now, the biggie is in social regulation. You've all heard about it. Social emotional skills at the core of everything we are doing today. And in fact, they are. Those all important EF skills, executive function skills of memory, of planning, of self-control. <clears throat> and we have educational programs that are focusing on that and using play to do it. One of the most famous ones is called the Tools of the Mind, a key example of playful learning throughout the school day. It was brought to us by Elena Bedrova and Deb Leon. And I just wanted to show you one example. Here you see the child with the ear. She's the listener. And here you see the child reading the book. She's the reader. Now, this listener has to listen to the child who's reading the book, and then they'll exchange roles. They find that these children who learn how to listen better, which is not really one of the best qualities in the 21st century, um, they're the ones who have better impulse control and therefore learn how to learn a little bit better moving forward. In fact, in this latest paper by Adele Diamond published in 2019, and in an earlier paper that she published a couple of years ago in the journal Science, they found the children who went through these kinds of programs actually did better, not just in learning impulse control, not just in learning social skills, but also in standardized reading and math scores. So the results suggest quite strongly that playful learning might just help you on a host of these skills. Now, if you wanna bring this into the classroom immediately, there's some beautiful stuff that's been done by Megan McClellan. She has a book called Stop, Think and Act. She's a very well-known researcher and she has games like the clapping game that I introduced to you at the beginning or conducting an orchestra together or just doing drum beats. And you can see many, many more in her book and in her research. What do these do? They help you learn executive function skills, listening to others. Now, playful learning has also been used in literacy, telling stories, wordplay. What rhymes with hat? What rhymes with cat? Can you find another word that has the root word teach in it? Singing songs, try this one with me. Ba, 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 what? I'm doing phonics right in the middle of a song. Dialogic reading, where you go back and forth, not just read to someone, but read with someone. And of course, dramatic play. And there's beautiful research that if you act out the stories, it turns out children learn more vocabulary and become better readers. Now, it turns out that we're actually doing some research in this area with a guy named David Dickinson and with Roberta Golinkoff. We have an adult read a book to, which, to a group of children in circle time. But we have some hard words in there 
we've put them in, like Galloping and Shield in the Knight and the Dragon. After they're done, we give them three different conditions. Some of the kids go into a free play condition where they just get to play with these figurines that we give them and we see what happens. Then we have a direct play condition where it's a little more targeted and we tell them kind of what to do. Like, can you make the horse gallop toward the damsel in distress? And guided play, where it's a little more targeted. We offer the same figurines, but it's a little more open-ended, letting the children choose the story. Think now, where do we get the best results? You might think that it would be in free play. In fact, one of my hypotheses was that it would be in free play, but it was not. <clears throat> it turns out that kids do need a little guidance. And in the free play condition, they did not do as well as they did in directed play and even better yet in guided play. So there's something to this. In our most recent findings, we push the envelope a little and use different play activities. We invented a singing activity, large and small group games, drama and digital. And our children learn the target vocabulary, wait till you hear this drum roll please, as well in the play condition as they did in the reading condition. Let me just show you an example of this. We asked whether playing a game might help readers learn vocabulary better than flashcards did. So we had a pre-test and a control, a pre-test and a post-test, and here's what happened. You can see this line is bigger than this, but look at this, whoppingly more than the flashcards. Here's what we did when we played a game, and here's our game. And you can see it's just like a snakes and ladder game, but we just put vocabulary on it whoppingly different than what we do when we do simple flashcards. Well, you say, this is pretty good for reading, but, but what it's, what's going to do for STEM? <clears throat> I mean, surely, Kath, your theories can't work in STEM. Well, actually, mathematics comes from learning to find patterns, dividing candy and sharing it after Halloween, sorting trail mix, playing a game of I spy, I spy with my little eyes, a triangle, noticing more and less, playing with blocks and puzzles, or playing board games that can be quite sophisticated. In our research, we studied block play to ask if it might build better spatial language and mathematical outcomes. Our questions, do we talk more about spatial terms when we play with blocks? Well, yeah, it turns out we do. Just by having blocks in your room, not taking the block corner out, or for more sophisticated kids or older kids, the Lego corner out, they start talking in more spatial language like architects do, on top of, around, in, through. What is the weighting that I have to do in order to build the roof on this particular castle? Do we talk more about space in certain situations over others? using these words? And the answer is, well, yeah. It turns out that in guided play conditions, kids use more of that spatial language and more mathematical reasoning. And why should we care? Because spatial language and spatial play are related. They're even related in the brain. They're related to later spatial ability, being able to copy these designs, and also to later mathematical ability. You should try it in your classrooms. Who were those kids who can do a 2D design and copy just what you put up on a felt board? And you can see these are simple shapes, but some of them are more rotated and some of them have more complex units. And here, I'm just using simple Legos. <clears throat> Another example is in STEM. We looked at kitty geometry and we asked, whether guided play might be a better way to learn than instruction or free play for learning things like triangles, rectangles, pentagons, and hexagons, these really tough ones. And what did we find? Well, you can guess it now. You could probably run the study. There were three conditions, a guided play condition, a direct instruction condition, 
and an exploratory, just go out there and free play. And what did we do in the guided play condition? We threw out a whole lot of triangles to the kids and we said, or a whole lot of shapes and said, can you find which ones are triangles? Some of them were lopsided. Some of them had the point on the top. Some of them were fat and some of them were thin. Then we did a shape sorting task and we had 40 cards, 10 per shape, but we tricked the kids. Three of them were typical, typical triangles. In fact, most of the triangles you show little kids have points on the top. Well, you could even expect kids to think the triangles are only things that have points on the top. Three of them were atypical. You can see they're smaller, they're wider, or they're turned. And four of them were just terrible, terrible triangles. Here you can see it over here. This isn't connected. That doesn't look like a triangle at all. Here's your atypical triangles, and here's your point at the top. The children were introduced to Lilu, the picky puppet, and they had to tell her which ones were real triangles and which ones weren't. Well, now is your moment. You get to guess what happened here. Did the kids get it right? And the answer is, yeah. In the guided play condition, look at this. They did almost as well as adults, much better than in direct instruction and a lot better than in just a free play where they just got to play with the materials. Turns out play is also important for helping kids learn causal learning. That's science. This research was done with three-year-olds and 19-month-olds. And while I'm giving you the evidence from slightly younger kids, because there's more of it, we know that it works with older kids too, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Can kids figure out that if they have a blue circle or a red triangle, that they should be looking both at the triangle part and they should be looking at the shape part in order to make a decision as to what is going to turn on a light or make a bell ring. And in fact, again, they don't figure it out as well in free play, but in guided play, they do. This is one of my total favorites. Playful learning also supports critical thinking and hypothesis testing. This was a beautiful study done by Gwen, Goodman, Spelke, and Schultz when they, they invented this toy. This toy could do four different things. Oh, it had a bell part if you pushed a certain button. You could see you could roll a little ball up here and it would make some noise. Or you could press something on the back and a light would come on. And the question was, what would happen? If a teacher instructed the child to press the button and the light will come on, see how it works? Or just let the kid go and said, here's an interesting toy, see what you can discover. They gave them time to play with the toy. They watched what they did. And then they wanted to see if the child could discover all the functions of the toy. It turns out that the kids who were told to press the button they just pressed the button. The kids who were told that the toy could do a lot of things discovered all the things that the toy could do. Finally, we're running some research right now to see whether we can use play to help support creativity. The task is this, these are older children. These are six and seven year olds. There's a ping pong ball in a jar and the children are instructed to find a way using these tools. No, 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 folks. They can't just take the glass and pour out the ping pong ball. They have to use one of these tools to figure out how to get the ball out of the jar. Those children who explored more, those children who figured out how to combine pieces, they're the ones who seem to have the most creativity and in fact, the most success on the task. Now, a caveat, digital toys don't always afford the same advantages for children. Even play that is fun, if it's not guided, is not gonna yield the same results. Witness e-toys. These have been studied with shape sorters, it's been studied with games. It turns out 
that the live right now still seems to be a little bit better than exclusively going on digital. And this, of course, has been one of the challenges for all of us this year during COVID. But let me ask you a deeper question as I move to what you can do with all this. Why in the world should playful learning support learning at all? Well, here are a couple ideas. Big idea one. Well, playful learning is active, it's engaging, it's meaningful. It's socially interactive learning. And that is how human beings learn best. Big idea too. Well, guided play is kind of like constrained tinkering. You know, all of us as scientists who want to learn things, we, we play around with stuff. And if it's constrained, we're more likely to hit on the right solution. I think of this as bowling with bumpers. You're more likely to hit some pins if there are bumpers in the bowling alley. So constrained tinkering, much more likely than if there's no bumpers in. And of course, you're not likely just to get a strike each time, even if there are bumpers. Number three, ah, guided play is the figurative equivalent of mise en place or a positive disposition for learning and exploration. That is, it sets up what the kid needs to explore. That's why they learn more, because it's as if the table is already there for them. Big idea for playful learning is joyful. Positive emotions help children learn. Finally, big idea five, which is the one I'm going to endorse here, is that play allows children to build a suite of skills needed for success. Collaboration, learning how to build it together, to work back and forth, that these are critically important skills, social emotional skills, that feed into communication, the ability to go beyond your show and tell and to tell a story, that feed into content and allow you to make connections and gain expertise, to critical thinking, which allows you to use the evidence. Which of those things that you put in the jar allowed you to actually succeed rather than just having opinions? To creative innovation, which allows you to go beyond just solving a problem to having a voice, to having a vision, to confidence. This is an important one. We must in our schools and outside of schools, allow children to fail because it's only when we fail and learn to take calculated risks that we will actually learn to succeed. We take these collective skills and call them the six C's for parenting and education. And in our book, we not only describe what to do with them, but we show how you can use that to foster playful learning at school, at home, and in the community. So let me turn there to a school system. This school system is in Westchester County, uh, outside of Philadelphia. They decided to change all of their kindergartens into playful learning kindergartens and to try it out. Could you put six C's learning into your classroom? Oh, the teachers were absolutely hesitant. They weren't sure. Was this really going to work? So they decided to do it through theme-based learning. And over here, you can see just some pictures of what went on. This was the theme of weather. They described the weather on Monday through Friday as they sat down in class. Then I went in and I went to the one corner of the class and I saw this kid when I observed this class. And there they were with a cardboard box going like this in front of another kid who was standing in front of a map of the United States. I had to ask, what was going on here? It turned out I was witnessing the weather report where the six-year-old child said to me, oh, actually, now this child is from Philadelphia on the East Coast, just to remind you. She pointed to the map of the West Coast, told me about the front that was coming, said that there appeared to be a low pressure area and that we could expect precipitation in X days. I thought, my God, precipitation, low front, and learning how to read a map? 
that kid has got it together. What vocabulary. Over here, another group was sitting at a table and you can see they have little droppers and circles. And their job is to figure out how many drops of rain could fill up the entire circle, which they then graphed. And we were all supposed to look at the graphs, measure their data. It sounds like a math lesson to me. And one of my favorites is these three kids. These are wooden spoons that they have that have characters on them where they were acting out a story. And they decided to take the story from three little bears, which was fine. And then they took one from some other fairy tale. And I said, oh, I've never seen these together before. And they said, no, we're inventing the story. It's a mashup, which I thought was just brilliant. So you might ask what happened after the end of the year? Did they get anything from it? Did they learn what they were supposed to learn? Well, it turns out they went better than they had at reading level on standardized tests, reading beyond grade level, but reading beyond where they were because this was a middle income school. At math, increased their math level beyond grade level. Oh, they had fewer referrals for occupational therapy that year, 79% fewer referrals for special education. And the teachers told us they enjoyed being in the classroom more. So people said, well, would it work? Would it work if you decided to go to a school that wasn't a middle income school? So we did. Grand Rapids, Michigan, the Godfrey Lee School. It's a 90% free lunch school where the majority of the population is Latino. They adopted a theme-based approach too. We trained them in the six C's. And the upshot is that they did better in each of the C's, collaboration, communication, content, critical thinking, according to teacher and student report. The teachers reported being happier in the classrooms. And, oh yes, did I forget to tell you, the children did better in reading and math than they'd done in prior years. And it turned out that they didn't have as much summer loss. Now I wanna to move to something broader because only 20% of a child's waking time is spent in school. What are we doing with the other 80%? And I'll bring it to a close on a very bold idea, playful learning landscapes. And you can see some of our designs by going to playfullearninglandscapes.com. It has a simple question. When is a bench not a bench? Can we transform everyday spaces into fun learning spaces so that families can get engaged to Jen in their own homes, in their own neighborhoods? What could you do with a bench? Well, we started with what we called the ultimate block party. It was science inspired activities that were done in Central Park, New York, 28 of them. Over 10 million people came. It reached 50,000 at the event itself. And what did we have there? We had people who created Play-Doh sculptures. We had people who were doing master building with Lego and invited the kids to help. And what did the results show? These kids changed the lens, as did their parents, on the kind of learning that they could do in everyday activities. So we decided to get bold and we moved into a supermarket. We said, well, I wonder if you put signage up in a supermarket, did you know when we talk and we read and we sing that we can actually learn more language? build vocabulary in a supermarket, do more math in a supermarket. So we put up sign prompts in the supermarket. They weren't simple things like, what is this, an apple? They were more open-ended questions. How many types of apples do you see? What's the same? What's different? The results. When we had the signs up, especially in under-resourced environments, we got a 33% increase in caregiver child language than when the signs were down. And it turns out the same thing happens when you wanna use STEM signs. 
when you want to measure, how heavy is this? When you want to measure, how much does this cost? When you want to measure, should I buy two of these or two of these? And this was done by Melissa Libertas. Finally, my colleague Susan Newman is even putting literacy into laundromats. And we're finding that it's making a difference. Here's what we did with the bench. Just outside the bench, we built puzzles. And we worked with the community to figure out what should go on in those puzzles. This was a plot of land outside a church in Philadelphia where Martin Luther King had given one of his freedom marches. And we wondered, would the children play with the puzzles? And many, we made them so that each time they went back, it wasn't the same puzzle. There's two puzzles on each of these frames. We also put in three other installations. We had hopscotch that helped children learn impulse control. We had something like a hidden figures that was way up high and you could see the shadows come down and children could identify the shapes and the patterns that they saw as the light shone through. Results, the number of families who put down their cell phones and started talking more with children and helping them with puzzles and using more spatial language and went up from 39% from pre-test to post-test. And when we compared it to a local playground, by the way, this isn't a playground, it's putting playful learning in everyday spaces. My gosh, language scores went up, spatial scores went up, and these are precursors to reading and math. And this work was done by Brenna Hossinger Das and Itai Palti. Here's another one we did. This is with Andy Bustamante. What about STEM? I mean, could we build a human-sized park and a game in the park that we're calling Parkopolis? And indeed, we did. This is our game board, and these are our dice. Notice even dice don't have to be like dice. The dice have your normal one to six down here, and here we have fractions written on the dice. So the kids can actually advance one, two and a half spaces, or three and three quarter spaces, and pick up cards that take them to this hopscotch game that helps them practice executive function, or to the shape zone. And while doing games, they're learning more. Does it work? Yeah, 47% more adults were using math and measurement terms when they were playing our games than when they were in a like game that didn't use these same well-intentioned adult built-in STEM materials. Finally, we even converted a local library, actually three of them in the, in the Philadelphia area. We call this Playberry. You can see here, you have a rock wall. The kids are climbing the alphabet and they're making words as they do. Here are little nooks that we built in where children could have conversations about books. And we also built a theater. What did we find? The number of children using number, spatial, color, or letter language increased 44% from when they didn't have this in the library. Oh, but I forgot to tell you, parents put down their cell phones to work with the children. And that's kind of a big deal. We were getting more interaction, language, and communication. Last one is I just wanted to show you that Andy came up with another brilliant idea he's calling Fraction Ball, where we went outside and literally painted a basketball court. And you know those three-point lines? Well, now we're calling them one or four fours, but you can throw at the three fours, the two fours, or the one four, and you can see how many points you can accumulate up to a certain number. Pick the number, see how many points you can get without going over. See if you can exactly reach a particular number. These kids were in third through fifth grade and uh, yeah, just two weeks, four days a week, 15 minutes out on the playground, those kids came back and they passed standardized tests of decimal to fraction conversion. Play is everywhere. It's in libraries, it's in parks, it's in benches, it's on sidewalks in Seattle, and you can create it in your homes as well. So imagine your school and community 
with a playful learning landscape that you design. We're not only putting it in schoolyards, but we're redesigning what the classroom looks like. And we're doing it with simple materials that don't cost a lot of money. If you go into playfullearninglandscapes.com, you can see more of this and you can see the playbook, which helps tell you how we did this. The bottom line here is that it is time to change the lens on the way we think about success and about learning itself. Learning really is everywhere. It's in the air. We just need to find it. And we haven't been as aware of it up till now. But from this point forward, you too can start changing the lens on the way you think about learning. I have to thank Roberta Golenkoff, who's been my partner in everything that we've done, as well as the many, many funders that make this possible. You can also follow us if you want to see some of the latest findings coming out of our lab, both the uh, findings on digital materials and playful learning, and some of the findings on what's going on in the schools. Um, and you'll be able to see also some of the webinars if you just go onto our Twitter account. I want to thank you, especially given that we had the technical difficulties at the beginning, and I hope it was just a wonderful commercial break, and uh, hope you saw the continuity. Thank you so, so much, and uh, give me a call if I can ever be a help to any of you in creating some of these in your own world. Bye. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. You have inspired us to all bring a little more play into learning. Um, and I know we're going to all take this back to our work and, and use it immediately. So, and again, thank you for your resilience today in our technical difficulties. Don't worry. We appreciate having you. So now I just want to turn it over real quickly to Gwen Hughes from the Mott Foundation to give us an update on some current initiatives. Good morning, Gwen. Good morning, Elizabeth, and good morning to all of you. And thank you so much, Kathy, for that uh, presentation. I still find that cardboard boxes are some of the best toys for my kids and not what comes in them. So this morning, I uh, really wanted to, it's a, it's a good segue uh, to lead into how do we create more of these programs um, that Kathy is talking about and what are those opportunities ahead and how the foundation here at Mott uh, is really hoping to support you in those efforts. I first just quickly want to say a big thank you to all of you, uh, whether it was delivering meals, pivoting to hybrid learning, providing social emotional support and home visiting to programs, uh, it is clear that you have really risen to this moment to help kids and families in communities who would be much worse off without your support. And at the Mott Foundation, where I have the pleasure of serving as a senior program officer for education, we couldn't be more proud of this sector and the work that you have accomplished. Next slide, please. Now this slide has a lot on it, uh, but one thing we wanna get across here uh, at the Mott Foundation, for those of you who aren't as familiar with our work, we uh, have supported the after-school sector, including the growth of the 21st century program for several decades now. One of our lead initiatives along with supporting 21st century is in supporting statewide after-school networks. I wanna encourage all of you, these exist in each state, uh, many of you are leaders of these networks in your own right or serve on the advisory. Uh, one of the core requirements of these efforts that we support is that there's a strong partnership with the Department of Education in that state. So these networks are here to support you in this work moving forward and in much of the programming that you have already accomplished. Um, so if you haven't already, I know many of you are involved, but if you haven't already and this is new to you, please reach out to your state network, uh, contact me at the foundation and we can get you in touch if it's difficult. Next slide, please. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, so at the Mott Foundation, as part of these networks, uh, and you know, one thing that is exciting for us is we are just continuing to increase our investment. Uh, over 
several decades, we have uh, granted over $300 million to support the growth of the after school sector and programs like the 21st century programs. Uh, we are continuing to branch into new areas like youth entrepreneurship, college and career readiness, service learning, and Mizen by Mott, which I will talk a little bit more about in a, in a minute. Uh, but this is really one of those moments where uh, we see this as a key opportunity to helping kids get back on track and to helping them thrive in the future. Part of these networks is really to incentivize partnerships, just like you do locally. State networks are doing that on the state level. And as we move forward, all of these partnerships are going to be key to delivering the kind of programming that has the play, that has the enrichment, and also the academic uh, outcomes that we know kids need. Next slide, please. So just a minute on what's ahead. You heard a bit about this from Terry Peterson. With the work that all of you have done in the growth of this sector, certainly we know there are challenges ahead. But one thing I do want to get across is we have collectively um, elevated the need for this programming. And it is clear, I think, to an increasing number of policymakers, education leaders, superintendents, principals, that the after school sector is really, really critical to supporting kids as we recover from COVID. COVID-19 has been uh, a huge challenge for, for all of us, uh, particularly for our lowest income kids. Uh, we know just from the recent America After 3 p.m. findings that higher income families today are spending at, at a minimum five times more than low income families. So for us, we really see this as until we can find a program and deliver a program for every child who needs one, we are going to continue to see the equity gaps that we know we currently have. So we see this as a key strategy. And with all of your help working collectively, we have a moment here in time where I really do think this is a pivotal time to make a difference in changing the entire education landscape and making an after school program not just a nice to have for policymakers, but for them to know that these are really needs to have. Um, the, the new funding opportunities, now you know I've, I'm always gonna give it straight to you. Uh, the timing here is critical. Um, these opportunities, some of which Terry mentioned, there is a significant federal uh, and state stimulus dollars that are coming both to the state administrations, but also a lot to local districts. And that is really happening right now. Um, beginning in March, we expect that there will be more support available to local districts. And this is a time where all of us and all of you can make a huge difference in expanding these programs and opportunities. If you reach out and talk to your school district leaders, um, talk to your partners who are, who are working in schools and make sure that you can offer uh, what you know kids are going to need during this time. Recently, with some of the networks, we were discussing um, challenges that we see uh, in sometimes making that initial partnership or that entree. And there is certainly a lot of focus on policy with policymakers right now on addressing learning loss. So you're gonna hear that as a narrative that really exists a lot among policymakers and school leaders. It is definitely something that our programs can help with. And we know that in order to address learning loss, we have to provide enrichment. We have to provide other opportunities and social emotional supports. So I you know, one, I guess, piece of advice uh, that we have just from talking to so many district leaders and superintendents is start where the educators are in your, in your district, um, in your partnerships, and help them understand what it, what it takes to get to addressing the learning loss that many kids are facing. Um, one thing that we're noticing, a multi-year effort here, 
for those of us who are familiar with what kids need and how they learn, we know that this is gonna be a multi-year effort. Another reason why timing is so important right now is that these funds are available for several years, but the models of programs will be set up uh, within the first year or so. So this is another reason that you're gonna hear from many of us that now is a time for us to engage and really help create the models that we think are going to transform the system but if we miss this opportunity, um, we won't have the same kinds of opportunities uh, several years from now. So uh, this is kind of our, our last push, I guess, uh, just to encourage you to reach out, um, play that role in your, in your district, in your locality, whether it's helping to address space concerns, helping to provide some of the online supports, um, you will find a way to uh, really partner with your school and expand these opportunities. Thank you, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Um, um, thanks. We have time for one or two quick questions for um, Dr. Hirsch Pasek. Uh, we have one from the audience right now, which is about those uh, grocery store prompts. Um, mm -hmm. People are wondering if there's a way that they can get those themselves to, uh, you know, share with their own grocery stores. Um, absolutely. Um, if you look at playfullearninglearninglandscapes.com, it's playfullearninglandscapes.com. Uh, you'll actually see examples of everything. And it's just right to us. We'll work with you to try to get those prompts. I should also say, by the way, that moving education beyond the school walls, I think, is an exciting idea for all of us. But I did also want to take a moment to say that all of you out there are my heroes because you moved beyond school walls this year in a way that challenged the entire society. And you came through. And when I looked at the recent data on learning loss, I was astounded that it wasn't way worse than they expected. And it's because of your efforts that it wasn't. So I just want to thank you and let you know that I'm here, my team is here, and I know a whole group of sci scientists who care are very much here to partner with you. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for, but we really appreciate uh, you coming and presenting today and sharing all this amazing information with everyone. It's been really great. And thanks for rolling with all the technical difficulties we had. Um, we really appreciate uh, having you here. Thanks again, Kathy. And we'll see you in the next session. It starts in a, just a couple of minutes.